السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Brothers and sisters, respected imams and community leaders السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته once again Thank you so much for being here today for this conference on, on such an important and, and timely and, and crucial topic and alhamdulillah, after such a fruitful day uh, for everyone, I don't have to be the one to break the news to you that we're living through some really rapid and extraordinary changes. And technologies that once seemed really far off are now part of our daily lives. And AI is no longer something that's limited to labs and science fiction. It's shaping education, it's shaping law, it's shaping medicine, activism, even how we interact with each other and how we interact with our team. And as Muslims, meaning as people that are entrusted with truth and with help, this moment is not something that we can afford to ignore. We don't need to be afraid of these tools, but we do need to understand them. We need to ask how they're being used, who they serve, and what it means to live faithfully in an age where models are helping decide what we see and what we value, and in some cases, even what is considered to be true. And the reason for this is because we've been here before. When social media exploded in the early 2010s, most Muslims and Muslim institutions were not ready. So we had platforms like Facebook and Instagram and YouTube that began to shape how our Muslim youths think and how they see themselves and how they understand their identities and even how we understand Islam itself. And we let Western companies define this narrative. And as a result, we're still playing catch up today on this social media front. Where we let algorithms by others decide what correct Islam is. And we watched while our scholars got shadow banned, our activism got censored, and we watched our youth spiral into confusion or hypervisibility. And all the while, our communities often remained unaware of how this digital world was shaping our real, tangible world. And then when advanced surveillance technologies were deployed, Muslims often were the first targets. In the UK, the prevent strategy used predictive tech to flag young Muslims as, as pre-criminals based on their beliefs and their online searches. And in my country of Canada, similarly, mosques were watched and facial recognition technology was disproportionately tested in immigrant neighborhoods. And now AI is beginning to take this even further. So we have models that are being used to predict risk based on names and locations. So a model can decide that someone is a higher threat to British society just because he holds the name of our Prophet and was born near Al Haram Sharif. And in Palestine, we're witnessing the most disturbing use of tech in modern warfare. We have AI systems developed by big tech companies like Microsoft, Google, Amazon, and others that are being used to generate bombing target lists in seconds. So these aren't abstract ethics dilemmas. This is genocide that's being accelerated by AI. And all of this is happening not because technology is inherently evil. It's happening because we weren't there first to understand this technology and to then help shape its use. And this might all sound bleak, but let me be very clear. This is not at all a call to despair. It's a call to duty. Because what we're witnessing in Hazza right now, that should shake every single one of us to our core. Not just because of the immense human suffering as members of our Ummah, but because of what it reveals about the future of warfare and surveillance and control in the age of AI. Because if we sit back, if we sit back and we wait for others to use and shape AI, then this technology is not staying in Hesla. These surveillance systems are being tested on Palestinians today and they will be exported tomorrow. So we're watching the beta test of AI-powered oppression and Palestinians are the unwilling test subjects. And the important thing to also note is that these AI models are not just being used for targeting, they're also being used to justify this targeting. 
So when a model flags a building as containing threatening infrastructure, that becomes sufficient justification to bomb it. And this machine becomes a shield for actual war crimes. And if we don't become knowledgeable enough about AI and we don't get involved enough, then we will also buy these justifications in the future and we won't know any better. So once again, this is why we cannot afford to remain on the sidelines of this AI revolution. Because every day we delay and every day we choose ignorance over engagement, we allow systems like these to be built without our Muslim voices and without our values and without our resistance. So today we see that the oppressed are crying not just from physical prisons, but from algorithm, algorithmic ones. And they're being crushed not just by bombs, but by biased systems that see their very existence as threatening. So what is our response? Are we building the tools that protect them? Are we training our youth and our communities to understand these models? Are we developing alternatives to serve justice instead of oppression? Or are we sitting back and hoping that someone else will handle the technical details while we focus on, on quote unquote, more important spiritual matters? Because let's be clear, there is no separation between the spiritual and the technological in Islam. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us the trust of khilafa on this earth, he didn't exempt certain domains from our responsibility. When he commanded us to enjoin good and forbid evil, he didn't limit that commandment to our masajid and our madrasas. And the Prophet sallallahu said, من رأى منكم منكرا فليغيره بيده فإن لم يستطع فبلسانه فإن لم يستطع فبقلبه وذلك أضعف الإيمان Whoever among you sees a wrong action then let him change it with his hand if he cannot then with his tongue if he will not then with his heart and that is the weakest of faith And today uh, the wrong actions are being automated and if we want to change them with our hands then we need to understand the hands that are currently building them if we want to change them with our tongues, we need to speak the language of those who are deploying them. So this time we really cannot afford to repeat history. We are witnessing the beginning of a tech revolution that is moving faster than any that came before it. And this isn't just about social media anymore. As I said, this is about every system. Law is being transformed by AI. Education is being transformed by AI. Healthcare is being transformed by AI. Theology, security, everything is being impacted. So if we wait again, and if we sleep through this beginning and remain complacent, then once again, we will wake up to find ourselves just reacting to damage. And instead of empowering our communities to leverage this tech for our benefit and to affect policy early on, we will just be scrambling in a few years to recover from harm. And the great news is we are still early enough in the shift to do things differently. This time we can prepare the start. We can learn and we can build and we can shape decision making locally and globally. And what gives me hope in these dark times is that we do not just have brilliant Muslim minds in tech, and we don't just have resources and networks like those present today. It's that we also have moral clarity that comes from submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we have a historical perspective that spans centuries. Because when the Mughals destroyed Baghdad, it seemed like the end of Islamic civilization. And when the Crusaders occupied the Quds, it seemed like the Muslims would never recover. And when colonialism carved up the Muslim world, it seemed like it would never be independent again. But what did the Muslims do in each of these dark periods? They didn't despair, they didn't retreat. They adapted and they learned and they rebuilt. So they came back stronger. And so today, as we watch AI being used to accelerate oppression and injustice, we have the same choice. We can neither despair or we can build. So concretely speaking, starting today, what can you do? I'll say for our dear Imams al Shatibs, you should learn the basics of AI technology, not just so you can leverage it as has been discussed, but so you, that you can also guide your communities of all ages confidently. 
And you should encourage your students and working professionals in your messages not to shy away from this field, but to engage with it responsibly. Use your platform, use the minbar to raise important ethics discussions that are rooted in Islamic teachings. And more than that, frame this as a religious obligation. When you speak about AI, don't present it as some optional interest for tech-minded Muslims. Present it as a fard kifaya, as a communal obligation. Just as the Ummah needs doctors and teachers and engineers, we need Muslims who understand AI and who can build ethical systems that can protect our communities from algorithmic oppression. And make it clear that for a young Muslim in your community to pursue computer science or AI research is not a departure from, from Islamic values. It's a fulfillment of them. We need our brightest minds working on the most important challenges of our time for our own. And for our scholars and our Islamic institutions, lead in developing what I'll call like the fiqh al-AI, uh, meaning like Islamic legal rulings that are tailored to AI's unique challenges, both in the present and in the future. Um, and I'll give an example from Yaqeen Institute, where I currently work, where we do have scholars that are actively researching and debating what uses of AI for content generation are halal for organizations that, that produce Islamic content. And we have like Aqsa, which is um, like a chat GPT alternative that's exclusively trained on, on Yaqeen Islamic content so that it can answer Muslims' questions better than chat GPT, which is frankly not considering Islam as a, as a source of truth. And so these are just examples of, of the kind of principled work that all of our scholars and all of our institutions globally should be pursuing in advance, not to do damage control. So we have to combine deep Islamic knowledge with technological literacy and AI literacy to provide clear guidance for our communities. And we need Islamic jurisprudence that addresses the fundamental questions of AI ethics that the previous panel was discussing, like how should AI models make decisions that affect Muslim lives? What are our obligations as tech workers when we discover bias in AI models? And these aren't just academic questions because right now we have Muslim organizations that are trying to adopt AI without this clear scholarly guidance. And Muslim tech workers are facing ethical dilemmas in their jobs without scholarly support. So we need scholars who understand and use AI so that they can engage with these technologists. And we need institutions that fund ethical AI developments. And we need fatwas that provide practical guidance for living as Muslims in the age of AI and algorithms. And for the tech professionals in the room, you can use your expertise to create, to create ethical AI tools that uplift Muslim values instead. You can build networks with fellow Muslim tech workers here and, and outside of this conference to advocate for justice and fairness in your industry. And understand that your work is not just a career. It can be a form of jihad. When you write code that protects user privacy, then you're defending human dignity. And when you, when you build models that treat people fairly and people of color more fairly, you're establishing justice. And when you create tools overall that serve humanity rather than exploit and oppress it, then you're fulfilling the trust that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed in you. Or alternatively, when you're sitting in corporate meetings and when decisions are being used, are being made about how AI tools will be deployed and used, then remember that your voice matters and speak up for the vulnerable and advocate for transparency. You have to insist on accountability as a Muslim and as a human being. And we cannot let anyone tell us that tech is tech and business is business and our Islamic ethics don't matter. We cannot let anyone convince us that technical work is morally neutral. Every line of code, every model you train, every data set you curate, these are moral choices that will affect some people's lives. And then for our community leaders and our activists, you have to understand that the fight for justice in the century will be fought not just with protests and petitions, but also with algorithms and models. 
we can learn about AI. We have to learn enough about AI to advocate effectively and to build partnerships with Muslim technologies who can help us understand how these systems currently work and how they can be changed. And most importantly, no matter your advocacy field, we have to connect the dots between AI and the issues that we already care about. So if you're working on criminal justice reform in the UK, understand how AI is being used in policing and sentencing. If you're focused on educational equity, learn how AI tutoring systems that are being developed might either perpetuate or address these learning gaps. If you're advocating for Palestine, then understand how AI surveillance and targeting systems are being used to oppress Palestinians and how alternative technologies by communities can support our resistance and our resilience. And as I mentioned, AI is everywhere, so we cannot sit this one out. For our parents and families, support your children who choose these paths. Don't see tech careers as separate from Islamic values. See them as an opportunity to serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and serve the ummah in novel ways. Create environments where your children can excel academically while also remaining grounded spiritually and not getting lost in secular tech. And for all of us, regardless of our professional and personal backgrounds, we have to be informed consumers and citizens. We have to learn enough about AI to make good decisions about the tools that we use and the policies that we support. We have to ask questions about the systems that affect our lives. We have to demand transparency and accountability from our governments and companies that deploy these technologies. Brothers and sisters, we are not powerless. We are the inheritors of a tradition that did engage with every tool of its time to serve truth and justice. Our scholars preserved knowledge within, and our architects shaped cities with geometry, and our merchants upheld Islamic ethics in modern trade. So this is our legacy as Muslims. Our legacy is not passivity. When the early Muslims encountered Greek philosophy, they did not reject it. They engaged with it and they improved upon it and they used it to deepen their understanding of Islamic principles. And then later on, when they encountered Persian administrative systems, they did not ignore them. They adapted them to serve Islamic governance. So today, instead of Greek philosophy and Persian administrative systems, we face AI, and our response should be the same. It should be engagement, not avoidance. It should be mastery, not fear, so that we can adapt it in service of our values and not in abandonment of our principles. So let us rise to this moment and let us be among those who shape the tools of tomorrow and that understand and, and impact ethics conversations around them, not just to protect ourselves as Muslims, but to fulfill our amana, our trust as people who bear witness to truth in every age. So this time, we will not be left doing damage control again. We should be knowledgeable enough and ready in advance to lead with purpose, inshallah. And the children of Gaza who are surviving today's AI-powered genocide, they will grow up in a world where AI is even more powerful and even more pervasive. So we have to consider what kind of world we will leave them and what kind of world we will leave our children and grandchildren overall. Will it be a world where AI serves the oppressors and harms Muslims, or will it be a world where we have shaped AI to serve justice? And the answer depends on what we do today. The answer depends on whether we choose engagement or avoidance, and whether we choose to learn or to wait, and whether we choose to lead or just to follow. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us among those who recognize the stakes of our time and who leave behind legacies that serve his deen and uplift our ummah. May he protect us from misguidance and empower us with beneficial knowledge and accept our efforts as sincere service for his sake. Amen. Can you like an hour video?